the other ones that I've got coming up are, oh, let me Google the name. I think it's Audio First Designs is the name of the company. Mm. And I don't know how much I can say about the designer, but the dude knows his stuff. So he's building a kit. I'm going to pull this up real fast just so everybody can see it while I'm talking about it. Because otherwise, I'm just talking. So give me one second here. Do, 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 do. Oh, I was going to say earlier while you're doing that, you're saying how easy it is to come up with. Oh, look at that. Yeah, that's so I'm going to scroll down. Right, that's it's the Fidelia. It's a two way uh, non 50 euro a pair. And it's a kit. Let's see here. Whoa. Yeah, that's cool. The bracing going on in here. I'm going to say those are going to have good directivity just by looking at the shape. Well, I wish I could say what I want to say about the designer, but let's just say that the dude knows his stuff. And yeah, oh yeah, see. here's their own spinorama, which my oh, okay, so, oh, there's a directivity right there. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah man, yeah. it's a it is okay. a fantastic sounding. And the interesting thing is, he and I talked about this. So he targets a smooth estimated interim response, and he does that. No, I don't want to say like at the expense of flat on-axis response, but he prioritizes the estimated interim response and he does what he needs to do to the on-axis response to get it to go the way that he wants it to in the estimated interim response. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like he he plays the trade-off game where some manufacturers, uh, will they base only their measurements on their performance based on the measurement of on-axis response, right? Mm -hmm. Foregoing everything else. And I've continuously found that the estimated interim response is more important than at least in my opinion and Floyd tool will probably knock my head off for saying it but it's more important than the on-axis response at least in a standard room room response uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm scratching I'm my chest over here, here. I'm, I'm sticking to it I will, I will go down on this ship I'll play the violin all the way till it sinks but okay Anyway, so, uh, with that said, that's a really cool kit, and they sound awesome. Like, they sound... It's nice. I'll just say that it's really nice to hear a, a nice linear speaker when you mm -hmm. hear speakers that are definitely colored in other mm -hmm. ways. And then when you hear a nice linear speaker, like, oh, this is what it's supposed yeah. to sound. Uh, let me see. I'm making some notes. Uh, so, okay, when you're talking about on-axis versus in-room, right? I think that's a it's tricky to make that distinction because I've been all about directivity lately. Like that's that's been the thing I'm looking at the most. Right. And so on axis is just one measurement. The yes. interim response is a combination of uh, the on axis and directivity. It's it's the interaction of that and this hypothetical room. Right. right. So I don't know that it's fair to compare those. Oh, uh, yeah. Two things. It's like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, what would be ideal is good on axis and good directivity and good in room. Right. You don't have so to play I, that game so much if you have the directivity correct. I don't disagree with you. Um, I think more or less what I'm really trying to say is there are some designers who put more emphasis. They struggle really hard to get the on axis to look good, nice and flat. Yeah. But when you put the speaker into a room, it may not sound that great. And I can give you a good example without naming a speaker, a speaker design. And I, because I've seen this in a lot of different designs, they target a flat on axis response. They have controlled directivity in the high frequency because they use a horn, wave mm -hmm. guide, something of that nature. So what happens is the directivity is flat through the high frequency. That results in a bright sounding speaker because if you look at the estimated interim response, it's tilting down. And then when you get to the high frequency, it kind of it flatlines because mm -hmm. the directivity is flat. So it's following the on axis response, which is also flat. So then you get a bright sounding speaker in the room. So what yeah. some manufacturers will do, Kef has done this. Um, I think Andrew Jones did this. I think I had a conversation with him about this. And if I'm wrong, don't hold me to this, but I'm pretty sure. But I know that Kef. Their on-axis response sometimes will drop down a little bit in the high frequency because mm -hmm. it's constant directivity. So yeah. when you have that constant directivity and you have a little bit of a tilted high frequency downward, then it results in a more smooth trend in the estimated interim response. I know it's kind of <laughs> it's easier if I gave you an exact example, but 
That's so it's very the common. Way, the way I look at directivity is slightly different, though, is I'm not just looking at the high frequency, whether it's flat or, or linear, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, it's my opinion that the base response determines how we're interpreting the rest of the frequency. So I'm looking at both the base and the treble, and yeah. I'm not separating them out and saying, oh, the base looks flat and li linear and the top end looks linear also. It's like if if the directivity looks like this, I think that's right. Right. Yeah. So you said constant directivity here. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you have your kind of slope like this. So <clears throat> how do I do this? So normally what I do is I invert it. I invert yeah. it. So it looks like a frequency response. Right. And right. so this is your base response. And what I normally want to see is kind of like a downward tilt that follows the same slope. But because yeah. Yeah. it's flat like this, like you said, so you expect the, the base is saying, all right, I want it to be downward sloping, but then it flattens out. Then it does sound bright. It sounds bright, yeah. Because Relative it's to the mid range and the base. Right. Yeah. Um, and you can EQ that because it's constant directivity. You could use a shell filter and take that down and you'd be fine, right? Mm. But coming from the perspective that I am, where I'm not assuming that everybody's going to use equalization, like I would say, if I had to guess, half the people that I have watching my videos use EQ and the other half doesn't. I don't know what the actual metric is. Now I'm curious. I should make a poll out of that. Yeah, I, I think but, they, you almost have to do the the room method that you've described before where you're just like, just treat, treat the room so that you're absorbing more in that situation. Make sure to check out our audio only version of the podcast at anchor.fm forward slash daily hi-fi or just go to your favorite podcasting service and search for daily hi-fi.